following podcast was recorded at the ANZUC Safety and Quality Conference 2014, Rapid Response Teams. Ken Hillman talks about the Rapid Response Team and the broader concept of patient safety. Thank you very much, Peter, and welcome to you all. I, I guess I guess if we if we look at hospitals where we all work, they've got some real strength strengths, and one of the strengths is that you've got one doctor looking after one patient, and we've got superb departments. We've got great EDs, and we've got great ICUs, and we've got the world's best surgeons, and all that sort of thing, and and that and that's really good for patients. However, we've learned over the last twenty or thirty years that it's not really patient-centred, and a lot of patients were falling between those silos and gaps, and I guess that's why we're here at the moment. And I like the word safety and quality, and so I'm just going to try and put rapid response teams into the perspective of safety and quality, because there's a lot of work around the world now which is using rapid response teams as a, as a model to explore the broader the broader vision of hospital safety and quality and so it, it sort of started really in the early 90s with this famous sort of publication in the New England Journal of Medicine which sort of stated that about 30 percent of deaths in hospitals were potentially avoidable which was quite a remarkable figure and that started a whole new approach to hospital safety, looking at patients rather than the silos. This was followed soon after by this very important paper, which instead of blaming individuals, looked at the systems that were created around the patient to err is human. And, and so it, it was taking the blame away from individual doctors and nurses and saying that we put patients in these systems which aren't really safe. So, oh, sorry. So, what, one of the ways that we measure whether whether a hospital is safe is to look at mortality, and there are problems with this because if you work in a hospital where you've got a lot of very very ill patients and you're doing very complicated procedures, then you're going to have a higher mortality than if you're looking after 14 year old people having minor sort of orthopedic operations. However, it is easy to measure and it grabs the headlines, doesn't it? So you'll see someone died because of whatever reason. But, you know, as I said, it depends on the patient population, on the procedures that we inflict on these patients. And also, it ignores what happens to patients after they leave hospital. And now there's more and more attention focused on, okay, so we did this operation in the 90-year-old patient with multiple comorbidities. We sent them home, but they died in two months or three months. And also, we're starting to look at what happens to people, especially after they've been in our, um, in our intensive care units with their quality of life. And some of the early studies says that this, many of these patients suffer. So again, that comes under safety and quality. And so we're starting to have a broader perspective of what exactly safety and quality is. There, there has been attempts then to try and adjust mortality instead of saying there's just this many people dying, then we try to do what's called standardised mortality. And those of you who work in intensive care know what this means. You use complex formulas to try and figure out what the expected mortality is, and then you look at your own mortality, the actual mortality, and that, and that sort of makes the whole concept of, um, of mortality a little bit more meaningful. However, it can only be adjusted for the known and measurable factors. It's difficult to measure those risk factors in trying to determine the equations which, which can try and predict expected mortality. And it can exaggerate the very bias that it's intended to measure. Some of the other problems include that there's much greater variation of quality within your own hospitals than there is between hospitals. So you might have a superb surgical ward and a, uh, you know, sort of a not so good medical ward. And so this standardized mortality rate for the whole hospital doesn't take into account the variation within the hospitals. 
For example, the famous Bristol cases where there was probably an unacceptable mortality increase in the cardiac surgery um, didn't take into account the other good things that perhaps Bristol was doing at the time. And it didn't identify the preventable deaths and it doesn't tell us where the problem is. It's just one figure for the whole hospital. And so people are sort of tending to move away from standardised mortality rate as a measure of hospital safety. So, so I guess I'll put this to you now and I'll, I'll come back a little bit later with this point. How do you know whether it's a good hospital or not? And what I'm saying here is really we don't know what a good hospital is. And probably the best, the best and the most accurate indicator is where would you go yourself? What's a good doctor? It's someone that you ask around and that's the sort of doctor that you go yourself. So that tells us that we really don't know much about which hospitals are particularly safe across the whole board. So other ways of measuring quality, I'll just quickly go through some other ways that we do it. And they're always confounded by this issue, that we have administration, politicians and management who have a different set of priorities. And you probably all know what these priorities are. Their cost, even though, even though people say we're worried about patient safety, cost is a, is a particularly important driver for people who manage hospitals. And the other one is trying to stay out of the newspapers. So these, these are two criteria that tend to be uppermost in the mind of people that are managing policy makers, etc. And whereas doctors and nurses, it's somewhere where we go to uh, where we go to earn a living and where we're looking after patients. And these two things clash. So it's not it's not that we're working in an industry where we're making cars, and, and that's fairly easy. This, this is top management have got different priorities and drivers. So we, can use, so we can use administrative data. We can say that if you've got a long waiting list, maybe you're not such a good hospital, ambulance response times, time in the emergency department, um, you're probably all, all aware about the four hour rule which started in the United Kingdom to try and place patients within four hours. Um, the United Kingdom, interestingly enough, dropped it after, after 12 months, whereas Australia is still playing around with the concept. This may be a good thing. It certainly would be a good thing if you've got a screaming child, um, but it may not be a good thing if you've got a, a, like a complex patient that needs complex history taking and, and that sort of thing. Length of stay, readmission rates. These are numbers and they don't necessarily focus on patient safety. They may just reflect the complexity of the patient's illness. Morbidity and mortality meetings have been with us for many years and it's not a bad way of trying to ensure that you've got quality in your particular department and it's the mainstay of review for many clinicians but of course there is bias in choosing the cases, there's bias in how they're presented and there's bias in how they're sort of interpreted. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have them, but we've got to stand back and look at the actual scientific sort of validity of many of these outcome measurements. Self-reporting systems, and most countries in the world have got these now, in that you send a report about something that you're particularly worried about. Its strength is that it's optional, and you can send them in um, without fear of being of being sort of punished for what you know for what you're describing, and it does sort of encourage non-blame and looking at the system. There's very little data on whether this does in fact improve patient safety. Then we could look at measures. We we can look at what we think is the right way of doing things. The evidence based way of doing things such as the time of antibiotic use in sepsis, the earlier the better. So that's a good process, me um, a good process measure. Beta blockers in acute myocardial infarction is another one. There's certain very strong evidence based ways of doing things and so if you conform to that perhaps you're doing the right thing. However, we're working now in a time where Patients are not as simple as what they were. 
So we, we often don't have patients coming in with a single diagnosis. They're often older people with multiple comorbidities. For example, a 90-year-old with a urinary tract infection. Urinary tract infection would be the disease. We'd be picking evidence-based medicine to support that. However, this patient also has heart failure, a bit of dementia, a bit of renal failure. And these things don't add up currently to a number or a word. They're just something that we know is in the background, but we know that urinary tract infection, its treatment and outcome is different in a 90-year-old than it is in a 20-year-old. Accreditation is intuitively appealing, and many of our departments and hospitals are regularly accredited. It probably improves patient safety, but there's been no evidence that it has. I'm, and again, I'm not saying that it's, it's something that we shouldn't do, but the evidence for it is not good. And if, we, if we're basing sort of the implementation of evidence-based medicine as a way of measuring quality, we really have very little evidence about the sort of interventions that we use to improve patient quality. I, I really like this slide. It, th this, this place, this is one of the places where we in turn um, so-called illegal immigrants in the, in the centre of Australia. And you can see on the outside, it's got that it conforms to the ISO standards. These are the world's best standards. It means that you're collecting your fire manuals and all of your other, other things perfectly. But if you look at what's happening in that centre with the treatment of these people, in fact, there were three people killed in the day after this photograph was taken. So you can conform to accreditation and the processes, but it doesn't mean what's happening in the hospital is perfect. So the patient safety industry, it sort of operates on incentives and disincentives, especially in a place like the United Kingdom. They look at figures and you are reimbursed according to these figures. There's policy reforms and restructuring of bureaucratic structures and there's been no evidence that restructuring health systems by getting rid of certain levels of bureaucracy helps at all. In fact, there's some evidence to say that it disrupts the work that we're doing and has, and has certain adverse patient outcomes. We can, of course, have inquiries, and there's been many inquiries in health when we particularly have a death that wasn't anticipated, credentialing, accreditation. IT systems, electronic patient records, there's been no evidence to say that these things have improved patient health care at all. And I find that very interesting that if, if you have a new drug in medicine, it has to go through a lot of processes to actually say that it works, whereas you can put an IT system and there's no scientific evidence of improvement in patient outcomes. And of course, we've got quality offices, quality departments in our hospitals now, but when we look at the evidence, there's no evidence at all that any of these things have made a difference to patient safety. That doesn't mean that the patient safety industry doesn't help. It's there. It's in all levels of health. It's very costly. There are conferences, journals, etc. And there are many safe, safety people in the hospitals um, doing stuff. Rapid. So what, what I'd like to do now is to move on to the rapid response system and how in countries like Scandinavia and Germany it's being, it's being used now in the broader perspective than what it was initially intended to. So it's, it's now used as a hospital patient safety system. And as I said before, it's organisational wide. It was developed bottom up, it was developed by doctors and nurses in response to problems. And the problems were many people were dying and having cardiac arrests. And so it's built around the patient. Now that that sort of, you know, that sort of believe it or not is fairly unusual to have a system that's built around patient needs. Does it work? Well, intuitively, it makes sense that you intervene early with someone who's got a serious illness. However, just like intensive care units, which is another intervention for serious illness, the evidence to say that it actually works is, 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 is minimal. Um, 
one of one of the largest meta-analyses has shown that there's been a one-third reduction, up to one-third, of a cardiac arrest rate reduction in adult and children's hospital, one-third reduction in mortality in children's hospital, and our own work has shown that there's a significant reduction of death rates in adult hospitals as well. So there's a bit of evidence, but that could, you know, that sort of, um, you know, like, like it doesn't stand up to the scrutiny of a proper randomised control trial. One, one of the advantages in having a rapid response system is that it doesn't matter what the cause of the patient's deterioration, whether it's as a result, of, you know, as a result of their own illness, or whether it's as a result of a mistake, or sort of as a result of various parts of the systems not working, it doesn't really matter what the cause is because they'll be identified by a series of vital science um, scores and sort of observational abnormalities. So it's a generic patient safety system that works across the whole hospital. The aim is many to reduce things like deaths, cardiac arrest, to improve appropriate care, to improve end of life care and to try and get the silos in health talking to each other more. And there's a lot of interesting work that's occurring lately about the way that by putting a rapid response system into, into a hospital, then you change the culture of that organisation so that they begin to work more across their silos. So it's a real-time, organisational-wide safety system. And the measurements of that safety system not only measure the effectiveness of the rapid response system, but it measures the safety of the whole hospital when you think about it. So the outcome indicators that are being increasingly used, they're not universal, and many people have got different ways of doing this, but the outcome indicators are mortality, and I've already discussed mortality and the problems with it. So we use two adjectives to try and make more sense of mortality. The first one is unexpected, and that is all patients who haven't got a DNR order because this system is not meant to save the lives of people who, um, who are at the end of their life and who are designated DNR. And then we throw in this other adjective, which is quite important, I believe, and that is potentially preventable. So th this is subjectively described as a death where there have been rapid response criteria present but not acted on within 24 hours. So here you've got two very important adjectives, unexpected, potentially preventable mortality, not just mortality and not just standardised mortality across the whole hospital. This actually applies to the individual. So if you have an unexpected, potentially preventable death in your hospital, this is the basis for doing work to look into, well, how did this happen? Where did the system fail and how can we make it better? And, the, and that's the same with cardiac arrests, unexpected, potentially preventable. And once you start de-identifying, aggregating this data and sending it around to the hospital, to the people who are responsible for the system, these are important adjectives which, you know, doc doctors and nurses are very competitive. And if you put it in bar graph forms, and one doctor's got one hell of a lot of unexpected, potentially preventable deaths, then hopefully you'll inspire them to look into the system where they're looking after their patients. We used to measure, and we still do in some places, measure admissions to ICU. And in several of the early studies, we did this quite a lot. And I guess the thinking was, if you could prevent admissions to ICU, that would be a good thing. And it probably would be a good thing. Early treatment means that the patient doesn't have to go to the ICU. But it could also be that a high rate of admissions to ICU is a good thing because these are a small group of patients who might have otherwise died or had a cardiac arrest. And if instead of dying and having a cardiac arrest, you go to the ICU, perhaps that's a good thing. So therefore, we're sort of tending to move away from it 
um, uh, from admissions to ICU as, a, um, as an accurate measure of patient safety. In our hospital, we now do a death audit on our patients, and it's done like this that we look at all deaths, we look at whether they were um, uh, whether they were DNR or not, whether they had criteria or not, whether there was an appropriate response or not, and the, and this group of patients is targeted and sent back to the system, and I believe that it's really important to send it back to the system and not just go up the system, and I'll come back to that in a minute. One of, one of the other ways that we evaluate rapid response system is the call rates per thousand admissions, and several studies have shown that there's a high correlation between the number of calls and the rate of decrease in mortality in cardiac arrest. So it's sort of a dose response curve. The higher the dose, the better the response. So when you're first setting up a rapid response system, you may have two to three, four calls per 1,000 admissions, and then as your system becomes more mature, you get up around 30, 40, 50 calls per 1,000 admissions. And it sort of makes sense that the more that this system's operating, perhaps the more efficient the system is and the better the decrease in mortality and cardiac arrest. One of the problems with much of the data that we collect in health, and I don't know what it's like in your hospital, but in my hospital, much of the data does not come back to us, the people that are running the system. The data goes up the system. And so I look at it like this. You've got data with a large afferent limb with armies of people collecting it going up to a small cerebral cortex where, where people decide whether it's important or not, and then hardly any of it coming back to you and you are the people that make the system, make the hospital safe. So. So I believe it's really important when we're collecting this data, the people that run rapid response systems are the most important people to know whether the system's working or not. So the outcome indicators need to go aggregated, de-identified, go back to the people who run the system so that they have control and can implement change. I'm not saying it shouldn't go up the system as well. That's probably important, but the people um, sort of the further up the system, the less likely you are to implement change. So this is sort of part of the data that we, that, uh, that we try to send around to hospitals with bar graphs, try to make it simple and understandable. So it's an acute hospital system with two major advantages for patient safety across the whole hospital. It's a real-time incident monitoring system. And so you not only monitor the incident, but you do something about it. And then you can also retrospectively collect and look at the data to nudge and to fine tune the system. I'd just like to finish off by coming back to mortality, because there's something that worries me about mortality, apart from the fact that it's in, you know, it can be a very inaccurate measure of patient quality. And that is that we, as soon as we hear this hospital has a high mortality, this surgeon has a high mortality, we often think, well, this is bad, we need to avoid this. And it's led to a system where we have a lot of patients admitted to hospitals at the end of life. And in order to try to avoid this word mortality, we continue to treat them. And for those of you who work in intensive care, you'll know what I'm talking about with people late 80s, 90s on ventilators, dialysis, inotropes, etc. They get caught up in this conveyor belt and where we're all trying to avoid mortality. And so I think we need a different approach <coughs> to mortality and end of life. And this, I believe, comes under safety and quality. People should be allowed to die safely, as well as people who've got preventable deaths being avoidable. So, for example, work that Daryl Jones has done says that up to 30% of patients that we see as a result of rapid response systems, there's end-of-life issues there. So, we, we also know that by concentrating on mortality in the wrong way, it can drive perverse practice. It may be against the patient's wishes. We, ne we may not have been honest with what we can 
and more importantly, what we can't do for that patient. In some cases, it prolongs their suffering and it contributes. In fact, it's the largest contributor to the unsustainable health costs that we've got. So the rapid, the, the KPIs, the key performance indicators that we use for rapid response system does not encourage avoiding mortality. In fact, they may be used to encourage better end of life care. And we've got data to show that as well, that many of our patients that we call to for rapid response are in fact at the end of life. And this may be a good occasion to actually stand back and look at this patient with a broader perspective. So in conclusion, this is data that we're just about to publish. It's from 84 hospitals in New South Wales. It's before the between the FAG system, which is a statewide system was implemented, but it shows that as we implemented the medical response systems across the hospitals, we significantly decreased cardiac arrest rates, mortality rates, and hospital mortality rates. And you can see here the purple line is the gradual increase of medical emergency teams, rapid response systems across the state, and the other lines are decrease in cardiac arrest, decrease in cardiac arrest mortality, and decrease in mortality. And one thing that I found very interesting about this study was that only 5% of the improvement in mortality in CPR was as a result of all the things that we do, like whether we give adrenaline or not, whether we do 15 of these or 20 of these and all that sort of thing. And he, uh, that, that only had a 5% impact. 95% of the reduction in mortality was preventing the cardiac arrest in the first place. So I believe that in future, with regard to safety and quality in our hospitals, that we should look at cardiac arrest as a sentinel event. Most of them either shouldn't have happened or they should have been designated DNR. So it was developed by clinicians in response to a real patient safety issue, and it was a bottom-up patient safety initiative that gradually engaged management and policy and administration. And I'd like to stop there. Thank you. For more podcasts from Antics, go to antics.com.au.